we go. This group is meditation, spiritual practices. Questions? Are there benefits in creating a regular practice or discipline in a daily meditation? Are there benefits in creating a daily practice? Well, I have two answers, obviously. Uh, I mean, the, the up-level answer is, doesn't matter. The, the answer most of us want to hear and we need is yes. It's absolutely wonderful to have a daily practice. Because most of us are very deeply in the world, and we get lost very easily into the stuff of life. And to have a daily practice that keeps reminding you and pulling you back, and awakening you again and giving you a chance to look at what happened and we, how you got lost the day before and keep putting what's happening to you in the world back into perspective is very useful. I mean, every time I read a, a little spiritual passage in the morning when I get up, I have them on the, next to my bed and I'll just pick one up and I'll just open and start the day reading maybe a little shloka or a little quote or something like that. And it'll just start me remembering what the game is about. And it reminds me. Now, that's a regular spiritual practice. It happens every morning when I get up. The sitting practice is extremely useful in clearing away and letting you see how your mind keeps creating your universe. Now, uh, most traditions require a regular practice to get ahead, to, to move ahead. Um, there are certainly traditions in which no regular practice is required and people do fine. So I can't say it is necessary, but I certainly find it useful and I certainly would encourage other people to do it. I think it's delicate that you do it from the place of really remembering why you're doing it and doing it with some kind of joy and appreciation. If you get into, oh, I got to do my practice. I mean, it's fine and the practice will probably clean that out in you. But I'm not really feeling, I mean, that's what happened to most people when they went to church every Sunday and they ended up hating religion. And I would rather push people away from spiritual practices until they're so hungry for them that they really want to do the practice rather than having them get a, giving you a sense of feeling you ought to do the practice or you're a bad person because you will end up hating this whole business. And in the long run, I don't think it would be good for you. So I would say to you, a spiritual practice is wonderful if you want to do it. And if you don't, don't. Yeah. Questions? Once I find an effective sadhana for myself, yes. how do I discipline myself to practice with compassion and without judgment? Um. <clears throat> There is a, a, a matter of timing in sadhana that's important to keep in mind. That I mentioned it a little bit last night, that we tend to overthink. So we, we, we often choose a sadhana, a spiritual practice, a little before it's time or before it chooses us before the marriage works. And we find ourselves in this ought and should predicament where you start out with great love and, and within a little while it's, oh my God, I gotta do my practice. And it's like another thing like washing the dishes. And um, certainly there is, um, there is value in doing a practice regularly every day, even when you don't wanna do it because, um, especially in meditation practice, because in meditation practice, the not wanting to do it is as much grist for the mill of meditation as wanting to do it. It all is stuff you can work with, with your mind. So that's very beautiful. Um, but um, the delicate balance that has to go on inside oneself, recognizing that if you build up too much negative tone to your practice, too much resistance, you're going to have a reaction to it that's going to take you away from it for a while and before you can come back later on. A lot of people 
were so gung-ho in their spiritual practices early on, I remember in the early 70s, that you'd find them five years later uh, at the local bars um, uh, drinking beer and watching, uh, watching um, television and talking about how they used to do spiritual practices and how they fell off the path. Now, it isn't really falling off the path, it's just another part of the path, as I said last night. But part of that violent reaction was because of the, in a way, the impurities with which they did it in the first place. So um, my usually guidance is to, um, is to go slow, is to not get too gung-ho. Don't figure you're going to get enlightened yesterday. Relax yesterday. Just start to two. Now, the other thing is when you say, when I found my practice, you can't assume that the practice you found is the practice that's going to last you for the rest of your life. Because who found that practice is in the course of the practice going to change into somebody else. And so the practice that was appropriate for the person initially may not be appropriate for you a little way down the line. So you've got to keep staying open. So you hear all these delicate balances that are going on in you. One is the value of deepening a practice. Like Swami Satchidananda once was criticizing me for being such an eclectic dilettante. And he said, he said, well, you see, he said, well, you can't just go around digging shallow wells everywhere. You've got to dig a deep well so that you get fresh water, which is just a metaphor that, I mean, and I, I could counter with, you know, another metaphor that would be equally as sweet uh, for the other argument. But my, when I watch people over time, what I see is that they start out quite eclectically and then they get drawn in to one practice quite deeply. And then when they come out the other end, like Ramakrishna, then they can do all practices and they're all the same practice. All right. So it, it, it's like a funnel. It goes in and then it goes out again, or this way, I guess, more appropriate. So... <clears throat> My, my, my answer is that you go gently. Uh, Gurdjieff said an interesting thing. He said that, um, he was a Russian philosopher, and he said that um, an alarm clock that'll wake you up one moment, you can sleep right through later on. And he said, you need to keep finding new alarm clocks to awaken you, because you can have something that awakens you out of your sleepwalking of normal waking consciousness, and it works one moment, like a, something you read. And a moment later, you're reading it, and you're busy planning your shopping list while you're reading it. I mean, you've gone completely to sleep in the process of doing it. So um, all of these are merely variables that you have to keep in mind as you're proceeding with your practice. And in terms of the question of discipline, you've got to test, you've got to you've got to work very gently with pressing against it, making right effort without turning it into a neurotic achievement game, which we in the West are masters of. We can take something that would be joyful, you know, like I'm going to drive to New Mexico. And within a little while, it's, oh my God, I've got to, we didn't make enough time today. We've got to go faster. To, you know, and you take the whole thing that's beautiful and turn it into a hell realm. And so... Uh, now, maybe none of you have done that. To me, that's a very familiar thing, of doing that kind of thing, of taking something that is quite delightful. And when you stop and reflect about it, you can take most things in life and turn them back the other way. You can turn them back into, wow, I'm driving in traffic, you know, instead of, oh, God, the traffic, you know. I mean, you can just keep flipping your consciousness. Uh, you learn how to play with that. Well, the same with spiritual practice. You can keep reinvesting it. And... Um, my suggestion is that you have a regular time each day for your practice and that you say, in effect, I am dedicating this amount of, I'm spending so much time brushing my teeth, I'm spending so much time going to the toilet, I'm spending so much time feeding my body, I am spending so much time feeding my spirit, awakening into my soul. This is what I'm doing. And this is a time that is sacred and it's not a time when the telephone can ring and it's not a time when people can call you. It's a time where you respect your practice enough to say to the people around you, this is my practice time. Now, when you have young children, you can't do that because they can't understand that, so you may have to do that before they get up. 
which is quite early sometimes. So maybe it's four o'clock, and then you take a nap later in the day when they can interrupt your nap. <laughs> because if you water down your practice too much, if your practice is a practice like meditation or study or chanting or mantra or something like that, if you allow too many distractions, uh, the world just closes in all the time. It's always closing in. When I sit down to do my practices in the morning, I unplug my telephone. And I mean, it's all right. Everybody doesn't have to die to your mind every time they get a whim to do it. It's all right if you're not there. And if they need an emergency, there's the police, or the fire department, you know. I mean, it's, I'm not critical to anybody's life that way. So, uh, and I find that otherwise you end up justifying, I couldn't do it because of this and because of that. And it's very hard because the world presses in so much to give that appropriate time. So a regular time, not so much time that you end up uh, feeling put upon by your practice. Right? And it should be a time when you're reasonably fresh and clear. That would be good. If you have two, more, two times for meditation, it's even better. But if you have one time each day when you can slow down and allow yourself to process what's been going on in your life, from a spiritual perspective and just kind of run it through, digest it spiritually, digest it into your consciousness. See how you got trapped during the past day, how you lost it. Just get a, and pretty soon those little, they're like little beads on a thread. And like say six in the morning every day, it's a little bead on the thread. And there's a bead six and a bead six and a bead six until pretty soon there is continuity across those beads that puts the rest of your life into perspective from that vantage point, rather than you being in the world going out into the spirit. The game is to flip it so that you're really in a spiritual consciousness playing in the world. That's really what the process is. The transformation for the initial part is to move the plane, the perspective from where you're sitting. Um, so a discipline, but not too violent. Don't get ahead of yourself. And if you feel it's too rigid, Stop for a while and try other forms. Keep allowing the eclecticism to go until you feel pulled genuinely into a deeper process. Okay, that's enough for that one. Let's see where we go. Who's on? Does the practice, does it have to be sitting and meditating or can it be other things such as working in the garden, feeding the animals? <coughs> Sitting practice, sitting meditation practice is just one form of yoga. It's just one kind of practice. It is a, um, it aids all the rest of the practices in the sense that the quieter your mind, the more you will be able to transform experiences in other parts of your practice. Um, but it is not necessary, all right? It is extremely useful, and I want to encourage it, but it's not necessary. And for people, for example, who are very, what are called rajasic, or very, there's a lot of fire element in them, there's a lot of doing, they're doers, it's very hard for them to sit still. And they may want to look for other forms of meditation, like Tai Chi is a form of meditation. Some people running is a form of meditation. They can get when they get beyond their muscles hurting and them thinking about how far I'm going to run today and how good I feel and how wonderful the air is and all those kind of wonderful thoughts, they just get into a pum, 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 and they get started to get very quiet in the midst of that and, and get very, very spacious in the process. So there are a variety of ways of doing meditation. Some people do calligraphy as a form of meditation where it takes very precise and a lot of artists describe that are not, that besides the aesthetic and the technical stuff, that when they get beyond that, often they go into an altered state of consciousness when they're doing their art. So it's possible that there are a lot of forms of meditation that you might find suitable other than pure sitting meditation. Um, on the other hand, sitting meditation has a cleanness about it in that it really shows you where you aren't continuously. It shows you where you're agitated. It shows you how much stuff you've got in your mind that you're, you're grabbing onto. 
So I find it a very useful basic tool. Um, and uh, what I find is the quieter my mind is, the closer I feel to Maharaji, which didn't always used to be the case. Now, um, there are other forms of yoga. Um, the predicament is, like take working in the garden, if you watch your mind in working in the garden, um, you will end up, you may have wonderful feelings when you're working in the garden, but you watch your mind and your mind is constantly doing a process of judging, of um, appreciating, of, it's always doing stuff of um, setting up an accomplishment, of moving from thing to thing all the time. What we're dealing with is what's called the monkey mind. It's the way the mind jumps from thing to thing all the time. And when you start to do work, we're going to do a deal in this situation when we get to the topic of karma yoga. When you start to do karma yoga, it's very difficult not to get ensnared by the worldly component of it, by the drama of it, and get into my beautiful garden, or look at how great these things are. And, stuff. and at that point, it's turned into a delightful worldly occupation, but it's not a liberating force any longer. Um, the traditional forms of yoga are um, dhyan, which is meditation, yana yoga, which is study, which and I would encourage you to have things like books of little paragraphs, these little holy books or big holy books, and have them around in some place in your house and just every day pick up one and read a little paragraph, like a little shloka of the Gita or something like that or Christ, or whatever, or uh, Rabbi Nachman, or whichever one gets you, and just read it, and then just sit with it for a few minutes, and look at your life in perspective of that one shloka, and then go on. That's a practice. And uh, so that's Gyan Yoga. So there's Gyan, Gyan. Then there's um, Bhakti, which is a devotional practice, which is just loving, which you, we'll talk about that later. Uh, then there is karma yoga. Then there's hatha yoga, which is using the energies of the body as transforming the energy through asanas or positions in the body, which are really forms of prayer. And they're forms in which the energy starts to move to the body in certain ways that alters the consciousness. And that involves pranayama as well, which is breath control. And then there's tantra yoga, which is working with the sense data um, we were having your, your snoring darshan. <laughs> He's doing not a yoga. He's doing a very esoteric form of yoga, which involves inner breath. <laughs> Then there is um, uh, Tantra Yoga, which is really using the senses, using the sense data to transform your consciousness, using just the sense, your experiences of the senses, and we'll go into that more later too. So, yes, there are many forms of yoga you can use, but the problem is trying to use things that are part of your daily life before you have a base from which to work in terms of quietness of mind and a good spiritual perspective is risky business because you'll con yourself a lot. Like a lot of people say, I'm doing sexual tantra. <laughs> what they really mean is I've got a new label for my sexual desire, which is justifying my desire system, but it's not extricating me from it. Because sexual tantra is a very formal thing in which your awareness is very, very separate from your identification with your desire. And most people that think they're doing tantra would be horrified at what tantra turns out to be because it isn't that kind of a rush at all. It is a rush, but it's a different kind of a rush. So you've got to be careful not to con yourself and say something's a spiritual practice when it isn't, because otherwise you will, you will cut off the opportunities for yourself to really do something that will transform your, your consciousness. So basically you're saying sitting is a good idea. I'm saying study, sitting, being with satsang, being with other people. Uh, 
Now, I'm not going to turn it into an ought and should for you, because that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> see, it, it just seems like that's supposed to be the ultimate, you know, it's supposed to be the should. Uh-oh. <laughs> that's supposed to be the ultimate, the should? No. No, I don't think it should be made that way. I don't think it should be made that way. I would say to you, don't sit. Uh, use the microphone. What'd you say? You, and see, you got here. Look at that. All you're not sitting got you here. What are you complaining about? Here you are with a, a group of saints. What more could you want? If you don't sit for another 40 years, you'll probably be enlightened. <laughs> so you've got to understand there is basic I, I'm not supposed to say this especially to a beginning group of people like us but basically I've read this there is nothing to do and practices are basically a hype now once you've heard that what are you going to do <laughs> it's interesting because I know there's nothing I can do because it's all unfolding in its proper course I watch my friends some of whom just garden and raise their kids, just garden and just raise their kids and just work, and others just sit and just go to meditation retreats. And to tell you the truth, when I look at all of them over the years, I'm not sure I can tell a hell of a lot of difference. <laughs> because uh, they, there's so much to do with the karmic unfolding of the individuals. Now, as I say, I'm not supposed to say that. I'll lose my, my you know, my teaching certificate. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Okay. Uh, once disciplined in a practice, how do we know when we've outgrown it and it's time for something new? Well, let's talk about what outgrown means, because if a practice is a true uh, yoga, it can take you all the way to enlightenment. Now, if that's the case, what does it mean to say, I've outgrown it? Does it mean you got enlightened? Usually not. What it means is that from where you're standing, you can't use it anymore to get any further because of the way you're standing in relation to it. What often happens, and this has happened to me many times, I've done a practice which after a while didn't work for me anymore. No fault of the practice, but the fault of the, of the marriage between where I was at and the practice. I then went away from the practice and then came back to it from a whole different place of my consciousness. Like I've noticed that I do intensive meditation retreats every few years. And I'll go to India and do spiritual, uh, like uh, sitting in a, uh, a, a puja to the mother for many days with uh, my Indian guru brothers and sisters. And each time I do it, I do it from a different level of my consciousness. I can feel that it's like I'm spiraling through. And I'm really a great advocate of the spiral process, of the spiral path, where you go very much into a practice, and then where you're doing it from starts to, it all doesn't work anymore. And then you pull back and go either back into the world or go into another practice, and then you come around again and see where you are the next time around. So that uh, the outgrowing is really just saying, you and I saying to the practice, you and I don't have any work to do together at this moment. It's not a judgment of the practice. It's not saying this practice is no good because it didn't get me enlightened. It is merely saying that who I am at this point and this practice, this interaction, I'm not intuitively feeling it's productive at this moment. And I think you have got to trust your intuitive wisdom about your own spiritual practice. You cannot buy someone else's judgments about you. You can't buy a book's judgment. You've got to run it through your intuitive judgment and say, what I really need is some quiet meditative space now. What I really need is to develop my heart. What I really need is to quiet my mind more deeply. What I really need is a fierce teacher. What I really need is a lot of loving and gentle support. What I really need is to get my psychological stuff cleaned out a little bit before I can go on spiritually. 
And if you start to keep studying, you'll begin to feel where you're blocked and where your next path is and trust it. There's a quality of learning how to trust your, your inner guide. Most people say they would love to have an external guru, but there aren't many external gurus alive on the physical plane. And what one does one, while one's waiting for the Messiah is one recognizes the truth of Ramana Maharshi's statement that God, guru, and self are one and the same. And you have to go inward to hear the intuitive truth of what you should do next and trust it. So you may feel at a certain point, like I go to India and there are wonderful opportunities. India is an incredibly rich spiritual teaching. I mean, just sitting at a chai stand is a wonderful teaching. You don't have to do... But I go to India and I go to the temples and I make pilgrimages. And I'm there for anywhere from, it could be a week to a year. Um, but usually it's maybe a couple of months. And after a while, I feel, I begin to feel my work is service. I'm supposed to be doing service. What's going on? And I think, well, now don't let your mind rush in. See, the problem at that moment for me is to interpret whether my desire to do service is because I'm running away from the deeper practice or because I'm hearing what, what is my, my karma. Do you hear the issue? And you don't know. You don't know. And many times you'll just do it and then later on you'll say, like I was with Maharaji. Now, Maharaji... To be with a being that is a realized being is like being with a pure mirror that shows you all of the places where there is dust, right? Because it's a clear mirror. He, he, has, he doesn't have attachments, so when you're with him, you just see your own attachments writ large. It's a tremendously graceful opportunity. And I remember now with horror the moment when he said, Jao, go back to America and how excited I was at the prospect of going back. Instead of saying, I'm not going, I'm gonna to cling to your feet, in which I might have then gone into deeper practices, I was eager to go back and use my newfound yogic powers to do good. You know? Now he, 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 he sucked me in, he said, you go back, you do my work in America. Ah, yes, right, okay, see? I mean, he, he, he hooked me just where I was hookable. See, I can be good and righteous and serve daddy and do it all at once. Isn't that great? But I know that had my, my yearning been deeper, I would have said, screw you, I'm staying. Because that's another path of the yogi. When the yogi really wants God and they get near a, 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 such a divine being, you just don't let go. You hold on, you beat at the door, you don't care if you wake them up, you just demand enlightenment. I could never do that. And I look at horror at my own predicament. There I was, my connection, and I was walking away happily. Right. See what second-rate teaching you're getting. <laughs> and you're paying for this. Can you imagine that? And then he died. Imagine that. So I think that it's really... Uh, I mean, the poignancy of our own predicament, the awareness of ourselves being stuck between with one foot in the world and one foot in the spirit, and the, the when you get too holy, the world pulls you back, and when you get too worldly, the spirit pulls you, and you've got to learn how to dance with that kind of tension all the time and keep bringing them closer together and closer together and closer together and closer together. So when you're doing a practice and the practice turns so it's not working. You go intuitively and you hear, and you either hear that it's not working, but if I reinvested it, it could come alive again in a new way, or I'll go do something else for a while and come again to it later on. And then you've just got to trust whatever intuitive thing happens at that moment. Okay. You touched on this question uh, when talking to a uh, compassionate action group, but uh, we feel that we would like the opportunity to hear you, your further comments on it. Uh, the question is, 
is our spiritual growth within our control? And follow-up question, what is the role of personal effort in our spiritual growth? In, in answering this question, you really see the, um, the seeming paradox that exists between planes of reality. Because um, when you as an ego feel blocked and frustrated and sense there is something else, you want to make an effort to go from A to B. So you want to make an effort to follow a path, to take a journey. And you therefore make the effort. You come to a retreat, you meditate, you force yourself, you discipline yourself. As the process works and you start to taste of another level of awareness, from which you begin to see the patterns of behavior, you see that the, that frustration you experienced and that desire for something else was all within the structure of the unfolding of the laws of your mind and your cause and effect, and, and um, it was, in a sense, predictable, or it was karma unfolding. So that the fact that you even seek to get enlightened or seek to know God or get closer to God, that is that is that's what's called in your good sanskaras or your good sankaras in Pali, your good um, your good past actions that have prepared you so that you are now ready. For example, everybody you know in the world, everybody in the world was born Everybody in the world got caught in separateness. Some of the people who got caught in separateness are so thick into their separateness that until the moment they die, they will not acknowledge the fact that there is a part of them that is unitive with all things. They will think they are only separate. And every experience they have that is unitive, they will treat it as irrelevant or as an error or as an aberration. I was out of my mind. Okay. And um, now, what is the difference between somebody like that and somebody who, when they awaken for a moment, says, ooh, this is real. And then when they go back into their separateness, they feel the sort of crampedness of their separateness, and then that starts a process which makes them try to transform themselves so they can increase the spaciousness and the presence time when they are in full awareness. Are you hearing the issue? Yeah. What's the difference between those two? Well, you can only really hear it in terms of these individual differences, in terms of evolutionary readiness, the way I, I feel it. I, I experience that there are old beings and there are young beings. I mean, there's the whole curve of beings, I'm sure. But um, at, at, the, at the oldest beings, there are probably beings that drop down to earth, um, to bless us, you know, in a way like a Christ or a Krishna. I mean, they come fully conscious. They don't lose their consciousness. They are what are called avataric forms, and they come down in order to give blessing. At the other end of the human scale are the probably immediately post-Neanderthal, <laughs> who, um, who come in full of, you know, like, and give me meat, and and you know, I'm, and they're really in. And no matter what opportunities they have, they will reduce those opportunities down to first chakra mentality, towards survival and towards getting what they want when they want it. And uh, somewhere in between, all the rest of us fall. And some people come in and they go under. They are born into a family of conscious beings in you know, in uh, Nevada or something, and they go under for a while, and, uh, yeah, I know, 
And then, um, then slowly, they, uh, after they've gone under for a while, they start to come up again, maybe in teens or something like that. And they went, really went under quite lightly. And they come back up and it's very familiar to them and they're back in more consciousness. And then they spend the rest of their life getting into subtler and subtler appreciation and letting go more and more of the entrapment of being exclusively in the separateness. Remember, the game isn't to deny separateness, but as Christ said, to be in it but not of it. In other words, to have both planes going at once where you are both separate and your unity and you deal with the heart and the mind and the tension that that's created. So, from an evolutionary sense, in a way, the, the awakening is built into the system. It is inevitable for everybody sooner or later over the course of millions of births, but at any one time, in, at any one point in the illusion of time, um, and you've got to, I mean, to just make it more complicated for you, you've got to realize that since time is all just an illusion on a certain plane, which includes reincarnation, that's all within the illusory field, that you, as the beginning of going to sleep and the, and the end of awakening, and your Buddha nature and your complete illusion, these are all, um, all present all at the same time. Past, present, and future are all here. You just have the illusion of going through time and going through incarnations. But when you were fully awakened out of that, you realize it was here all the time, and all of it was here. And the fact that you think you're on a time trail is just within your mind. It's, at, um, it's a very deep level, but it's within the mind, which works, works in time and space. So, I would um, I'd answer specifically the question saying that... Um, that awakening is built into the system. And I mean, I've watched that, uh, I've learned how to pump people up to experience a moment of awakening. But then I've watched, it's like a, having a tire sometimes with a big leak in it. And you pump it all up and they say, oh yeah, and then you turn around a moment later and they're and greed and desire and lust and fear. And, and you think, what happened to that? And somebody else, you touch them and they open and everything changes in their life and they never go back. And uh, I, after a while, I've learned to listen more carefully to who people are and where they are in the evolutionary scale and be less manipulative to try to get them to be something other than they are, but to really honor who they are, where they are at that moment and understanding the appropriateness of where they are and that it's unfolding fine and appreciating it. Um, I mean, one of the greatest things that happened to me in my relation with my father was when I finally allowed him to be who he was. Instead of trying to make him into who I thought he should be. And when he stopped trying to make me into who he thought I should be, we could become friends. So my sense is that uh, you deal with this funny statement, there's nothing to do, so do it. That at the level, the higher level, there's nothing to do because it's all unfolding. And at the, at the level of ego, you want to do something, so do it. But the person who's doing it never gets enlightened anyway. You also understand that. That the ego who says, ooh, I can awaken, that ego is, is going to die in the process. What is enlightened is not who you think you are, but who you are. And so even the trying will finally have to be given up. Like Trungpa Rinpoche, when I sat with him in meditation once, he said, Ramdas, let's just uh, do this specific meditation of expanding outward. So we started to expand outward, looking in each other's eyes. He said, Ramdas, are you trying? I said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> he says, No, Ramdas, don't try. Just expand. And it's that interesting thing of what do you do when you don't try? See, people come and they say, I ought to meditate. I say, don't. Then other people come and say, oh, thank God I can meditate. And it's just a timing process. We often live in our minds ahead of our intuitive readiness for something because we, we think our way into things and we tend to overkill with our minds. So we know where we think of where we're going before we're ready to go there. And the result is 
we're always in our thoughts, which are a little ahead of ourselves. We won't slow down enough to be in it fully in our being. So we're always we're doing things as we think we ought to do them or should do them. We're always modeling ourselves. While if we just slow down, it's like trying to go to the toilet before you really need to go. You know, and you, mm, and you, mm, while a few moments later, there's no problem at all, you know, and if you just waited a little longer, it would all be fine. There's a, there is a timing in all these things. <laughs> I'm not using a lot of anal humor these days. I... Um, and I think it's very tricky business when you're in the when you're in the retreat business, like I am. I mean, I mean, you guys are my livelihood. And if I say to you, "There's nothing to do," and the whole thing's a racket, <laughs> I am biting the hand that's feeding me. But at the same moment, that's true. That uh, I'm not sure you're going to get to where you're trying to go any faster by being here than by not being here. But it's a pleasant thing to do till the Messiah comes. I mean, it's just that kind of. Uh, uh, yeah. And it was it, it was it was your past experiences that made it desirable when you see a catalog that says retreat, meditation, Ram Das, all that stuff, to say, "Oh, I want to go." And you begin to quiet down and watch the unfolding. And I found myself, I remember being, I've talked about this before, I was in a, in a, a sauna in Santa Fe, New Mexico, with um, um, Allen Ginsberg and uh, a Tibetan nun, and um, I think Gary Snyder was there. There were a couple of, maybe five or six people there. And I got a telegram saying, uh, we are holding a space for you at the Rohatsu Dai Sashin, which is the, that's the fiercest Zen sitting they have in that uh, Zen tradition. I hadn't even asked them to hold me a space. And they said, it starts in two days. And I was so happy here, we were kind of stoned, and it was kind of really relaxed and nice, and I thought, what? why would I want to do a thing like that? I mean, it's really fierce. You know, they whip you with sticks in that one. You know, you sit like this, and if you go, they come up, and the guy bows to you, and you bow to him because they, they busted you, see? And then you lean like this, and he hits you on this shoulder, and then you lean like this, and he beats you, and then you thank him, and he thanks you. And it's a genteel sadomasochism. <laughs> and I found myself on the plane the next day going there. And I thought, I am voluntarily entering into this thing for nine days, which was, um, it's like a hell realm. Just because I am yearning to get rid of the garbage in my head that is keeping me from the clarity that I know is possible. I'm yearning for that clarity in the same way as you crave salt or you crave water at a certain moment. And that is just a kind of evolutionary readiness. <laughs> 